I don't know if uh, what I will present to you will be simple or complex. Anyway, it will be controversial. <laughs> and we will have possibly a lot of discussion on it. And so I will begin by, by saying that, uh, as you know, we will see some point. I don't know why this is coming. So the context, the context you know this uh, as me. I mean, uh, colorectal cancer is a problem of public health. But I think the, the most important is that to see that 50% of the patient will develop metastasis and that the death of the patient is related to liver metastasis in two thirds of this case. So to focus on the treatment of liver metastasis is something very important for the patient. And so what we know by the past was that indeed uh, resection is the only way, even today, for having a long-term survival, if not a cure. This was known in the past, but it's still the case. And here you have the liver med survey with uh, around uh, 30,000 uh, patients uh, submitted to resection. And you can see here that the resection do much better than the absence of any resection. And this is clear. We have been learned by standard of liver resection. And uh, what we know by the past is that indeed, and this was made by Joannes Schiele, uh, showing that in fact, complete resection is associated with long-term survival. But when we do an incomplete liver resection, the survival in the past was no significantly better than the absence of any liver resection. And so resection, we have been learned with the, the concept of saying that resection should be complete. And the gold standard, as you know, is to try to do as much as possible R0 resection. What we have learned in the past uh, 10, 15 years is that in fact we have uh, come a little bit more to consider that liver resection should not be precluded for any patient, even if uh, I would say the resection has no uh, 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 has a narrow margin. And this has been done by uh, the, the, the memorial. This is a paper of the memorial. And uh, also our philosophy since more than uh, 20 years at Paul Bruce Hospital was not to preclude any liver resection provided that it could be complete even at the contact of vessel as you can see here at the contact of a, a portal uh, i would say vessel or even uh, hepatic vein and by doing this we were able to show that in fact the survival was not clearly significantly different as you can see here in this paper fi finally the overall survival was comparable in the two groups r0 and r1 this was confirmed, interestingly, by the MD Anderson, but only in patients with major pathological response. And here we come possibly to a very important concept that R1, okay, but only in patients responding very well to chemotherapy. And this uh, assumption was further confirmed by the older team of Guido Torzilli in Milan, showing that, in fact, we should not consider R1 resection as a whole, but differentiating R1 vascular with similar results as compared to R0 and R1 parenchyma, who clearly has a lower survival benefit. And so the question today is, should we go further? Going further means double king surgery, meaning R2 resection. And in fact, I will try to provide you a, a certain number of arguments and the first one is the, the bulking-like treatment. The bulking-like treatment is resecting patients, as an example, with more than 10 liver metastases. It is, uh, I would say, uh, very uh, likely that when we resect a patient with more than 10 liver metastases, we don't resect the totality of the liver disease. But even by doing this, we were able in liver med survey to demonstrate a 30% five-year survival. Another example, and this very frankly surprised me, is the evaluation of the result of R2 resection in liver med survey. As you can see here in liver med survey, 
the centers reported more than 2,000 patients for whom the resection has been incomplete. And amazingly, I would say the survival is 22% at five years. A third example is uh, this randomized study, the EORTC trial, comparing uh, chemotherapy by Folfox Biva compared to Folfox Biva plus radiofrequency in patients with up to 10 metastases. And by doing this, they were able to show, to show that by adding a local treatment to patients with less than 10 metastases, combine this with systemic chemotherapy, the survival was significantly better than systemic chemotherapy alone. And uh, this uh, paper also from uh, China's group, comparing the bulking RFA, hep uh, hepatic arterial infusion and systemic chemotherapy versus the same treatment without the bulking RFA. And uh, by the bulking, they uh, said ablating over 60% of total tumor volume. And they demonstrate, retrospectively, of course, that by debulking, adding debulking uh, RFA to hepatic arterial infusion and systemic chemotherapy, the five-year survival was significantly better than the same treatment without local treatment. So debulking RFA followed by chemo had better overall survival compared with chemotherapy alone. Another, I would say, anecdotal uh, fate is uh, the, the, I would say the accidental hepatectomy, unexpected hepatectomy. I'm not speaking about such type of patient, marginally, uh, I would say, resectable or non-resectable, for whom it is now today very well demonstrated that we can provide a survival benefit by uh, doing rescue surgery after downsizing chemotherapy. And this is, uh, anyway, confirmed by the result of liver med survey. What I'm speaking is such type of patient that very obviously can be considered as definitely non-resectable. This patient, we operated uh, him with Henri Bismuth a long time ago, and we did an hepatectomy. He had a strong response to chemotherapy. We did an hepatectomy, which probably was incomplete. The patient survival 8.5 years. Another example, such type of patient, 63 years old and so on, involvement of all the right liver, segment four with multiple nodules also on the left lobe. Clearly this patient could be considered as definitely unresectable. But because of the strong response to chemo, I was led by my oncologist to propose her uh, uh, resection. I know by advance that it was impossible to cure this patient. But anyway, I did a uh, right hepatectomy, uh, resection and RFA of uh, the, the remnant nodule on the left. I do my best. This was, I would say, the response after folfoxetuximab. This was after the resection we did. But the patient recurred in the ovary, recurred in the lung. But finally, this patient survived more than five years. Probably without the help of any surgery, this patient will have died much uh, earlier. Now, another important thing to consider is not only the, the liver disease, but recently, as you know, we have been teached with the definition more practical than dogmatic that we should remove all the liver metastases even in the case of extrahepatic tumor, when these are also resectable. What we know is that when we have concomitant extrahepatic disease, even resectable, the survival is divided by two. Here you have 25 versus 47. And the principle was we can operate this patient only when extrahepatic disease is also resectable. But the MD Anderson opened a new possibility, which is to resect the liver without resecting the lung when the lung metastases are unresectable. And by doing this, here you have the curve where the two sites were resected, the ideal situation. Here, K 
chemotherapy only, no resection of the liver, no resection of the lung. But here you have the result of patients resected from the liver, but not resected from the lung. And they conclude by saying that, in view of this fact, that resection of, without, of liver metastasis without resection of lung metastasis is associated with an intermediate survival. And this was confirmed by the group of Geneva in the liver med survey material of a cohort of patients, showing here liver only, here resection of liver and lung in blue, and here resection of liver without resection of lung. You can see that the survival is lower, but it's not nil. And so we come today to a possibility of saying, when we have a patient with lung metastasis, non-resectable, it could exist a possibility to provide a better survival to the patient to resect the liver. The bulking now, we come to oncological concept. And the medical oncologists know this very well, much better than us. Here you have the median survival according to the situation of the patient with regard to chemotherapy. Progressive disease, seven months, sorry. Uh, I would say stable disease, 14 months. Partial response, 18 months. Complete response, 29 response. So it is very clear and very well demonstrated that when you have, of course, a good response to chemo, you increase, I would say, the survival of the patient. But when we are doing debulking surgery, we are doing a sort of complete or almost complete response to chemotherapy. And so why not adding, I would say, the good response to chemotherapy to the possibility of complete response by debulking surgery with a hypothesis that we will increase the survival of the patient. This situation is demonstrated in other models of a cancer patient. It is the case, for example, for ovarian cancer. Why? Because we know that chemotherapy in ovarian cancer is very active. And because it's very active, you see such type of patient, maximum cytoreduction, reduction, improved survival in ovarian cancer, even when complete gross resection is not feasible. The same is observed, I would say, for neuroendocrine tumor. Cito reduction is doing better than embolization for symptomatic hepatic metastasis and carcinoid neuroendocrine tumor. And the conclusion is that cito reduction should be pursued whenever possible, even if complete resection may not be achievable. In that case, this is probably related not to the efficacy of chemotherapy, but to the slow growing process of neuroendocrine tumor. So a different situation. And anyway, I would say, what is a cutoff? Nobody knows, but in this paper, it is said that 70% reduction in the tumor load in patients with neuroendocrine metastasis could be something who help gaining survival at long term for the patient. And so if we come now, I would say, to what we know in colorectal liver metastasis, very few things in the literature, but this paper is for me a, a very, very intelligent paper. It was done by uh, Kuniyo Tanaka, a Japanese surgeon, who compared the overall survival after surgery of patients with uh, late recurrence and patient with early recurrence. And the assumption was, and this is, a, I would say, the intelligent approach of this, was that early liver recurrence, three to four months after surgery, might be explained as a microscopic tumor left behind during liver resection. And this is equivalent to the bulking surgery. The surgery has not been complete. And so they take, they took, I would say, all the resected patients, R0, R1, with bilobar and tumor size more than four centimeters, more than 100 patients, and they compared those who had early or late recurrence. Okay? And there were 
there were no difference in survival. And so because of this, they conclude the bulking surgery, in view of this result, may be justified. When Guido Torzilli, who speak, spoke this morning, is reporting uh, such, uh, I would say, fantastic surgery he is doing in patients with multiple metastases, in patients with, uh, he said this morning, 80 liver metastases, if I understand well. But when you resect a patient with more than 20 liver metastases, very clearly, you are doing the bulking surgery. You are not doing curative surgery. And anyway, he demonstrated by his result that finally the survival is more than acceptable. And another example, this patient with 20 synchronous bilobar liver metastases who are treated not by the bulking, but was treated by a two-stage hepatectomy after a good response to chemotherapy. But this patient presented 32 liver metastases in, in the liver. And she's presently alive and disease-free more than 10 years after three recurrence treated by radiofrequency and repeat hepatectomy. We have uh, conducted since uh, uh, some years, uh, I would say, uh, a prospective study to explore such type of uh, the bulking surgery. And here you have our result with uh, presently uh, offering such type of uh, strategy to 26 patients. Some of the patients were, I would say, uh, contraindicated because of disease progression, carcinomatosis, diffuse liver infiltration, lymph node. And we keep with 21 patients who underwent hepatectomy without any possibility of doing what we used to do to stage hepatectomy. The, uh, we did the bulking surgery. And these are the present results. We should be careful, of course, because uh, uh, I would say it is a preliminary analysis. But what we can say is that the result in survival are, I would say, uh, promising. And we wait, are waiting for more patient, more follow-up, and so on. But anyway, it seems that such type of concept is floating. Of course, the disease-free survival is much lower than the overall survival, as expected. But by using and repeat hepatectomy, it is possible to increase, I would say, the initial disease-free survival and to increase it to 32% at two years after the debulking surgery. A point I will finish on this, which is very important, is the price to pay for that. Because, of course, if we are doing a non-validated strategy, and we increase uh, considerably the mortality, this is not a good way. But if you see, I would say, uh, in LiverMed survey, why LiverMed survey? Because LiverMed survey include a lot of centers in the world with experience, with, without expertise, uh, small, big. It's a sort of, uh, I would say, daily snapshots of what is liver resection in the world the mortality is 2.7%. And when you see the evolution of this, the operative mortality in the three months following surgery, liver surgery, has decreased by half from 2.8% in the year 2000 to presently 1.4%. What does it mean? It means that if we are wrong in the indication of debulking surgery, this is compensated by the fact that the risk for the patient is not so high. And this is very important to consider. So in summary, <clears throat> the fact about our current policy is that what we call curative surgery, we should be very modest because curative surgery is denied by the 60-70% risk of recurrence after resection. And we know that. The higher the number of lesions, the lower the chance of achieving curative surgery. Are we doing mostly R0, R1 resection or unintended R2 resection? The concept of the bulking surgery is validated for ovarian and neuroendocrine tumor, is strongly suggested for colorectal liver metastasis by result of R2 surgery, resection of more than 10, 
the paper about radio frequency combined with systemic chemotherapy. And what we know is that the increasing efficacy of chemotherapy is potentially changing the dogma of only R0, R1 resection and opening the way to intended, of course, in selected patient, R2 resection. We know that the literature is extremely limited and that still there is no definition of double king surgery for colorectal metastasis. Should we uh, have 70%, 80%, 90%, I will be much more in favor of at least 90% of all the tumor load of the patient to do it. But anyway, there is no clear cutoff in the literature. What should be the target of patients? The target of patients should be those patients with multinodular disease, unresectable by one stage surgery, who are not even suitable for two stage hepatectomy or ALPS, patients with unresectable colorectal liver metastasis, who responded well to downsizing chemotherapy. The expected overall survival, we have the potential to achieve favorable outcome in selected patients by revisiting the so-called double king surgery concept. But I would say, in our mind, all depends on the objective. If we can accept to prolong survival rather than cure for patients, we can probably explore the concept of the bulking surgery at the condition to remove at least 80, 90% of the tumor load in very selected patients with a strong response to chemo, even in case of limited non-resectable pulmonary metastasis, provided an acceptable risk for the procedure. And so we come to a concept that possibly the bulking surgery could be the best palliative treatment in association with chemotherapy. And so I like this sentence who say, to achieve that the possible may exist, we have always to try the impossible. And so we can modestly begin by trying which appear today as impossible in a way to explore in a very selective way to try to open the way in the near future, possibly, to revisiting the double king surgery concept. Thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor Adam, for this uh, bit out of the box presentation. I see that Professor Henri Bismuth wants to start <coughs> the discussion. René, <coughs> always fascinating what you are saying. <coughs> let, let me say this. Many years ago, when I was speaking about liver metastasis, I used to say <coughs> there is no chance for a patient <coughs> to be cured <coughs> sorry, without liver surgery. And often in the audience, there was a non-surgeon, an oncologist saying, oh, I have patient survive without liver surgery. And I said, okay, send me the file of the patient. And I never received one, never. And I was comfort in the idea that there was no chance for a patient to be cured without liver surgery. Now, at the beginning of your talk, you show figure from the uh, registry, your registry, with 10% of the patient alive after 10 years without surgery. Who are these patients? It is fascinating to know about who are they what kind of treatment they receive, uh, what kind of tumor. Uh, I, I don't know, but this is very interesting. But that means, do you think today it is possible for me to say to a patient, if I do surgery of you, you are 40% to be alive at uh, 10 years. If not 10%, at that time the patient say, ah, I prefer not to have surgery. 10% mm -hmm. is good mm -hmm. compared to 40 there is something which is strange. Tell me. Yes. Now, the things have evolved. In the past, it was probably less than 5%. Today, with very active chemotherapy, with targeted therapy, and possibly tomorrow, with, uh, or even today, with immunotherapy, we will increase the survival of patients untreated by any liver surgery. And so, to say 10% is uh, at five years, in patients not submitted at all to liver surgery is a little bit optimistic because there are patients only included in, uh, in trial and so on. They are very, very selected. But 
we can, uh, we can estimate today that there is a possibility between 5 and 10% to the patient without any liver surgery to be alive at, uh, at five years, five years. At 10 years, <laughs> no more. The figure is 10 years. Yes. No, it's, it's, it's five. I no, can, 10. I can show you. Okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, we're really out of time. So short question, short answer, please. Yeah. Very short question, Rene. Very interesting idea. Uh, what's your opinion if we add organoids to it? Because that would be debulking an organoid, uh, looking which chemotherapy and therapy would be the most optimal. Do you think there is a place for that therapy? A place for? Organoids. So you just take a piece of the tumor, you cultivate it, and you're going to look which chemotherapy or regimen is the best, and then include it in the debulking scheme. Yes, I think so. Yes, why not? Why not? Another out-of-the-box idea, thank you. Um, uh, just short questions. Uh, very often we have uh, irregular uh, uh, response to chemotherapy. Why shouldn't we aim to do R2 resection, resecting only the uh, chemotherapy-resistant metastasis, for example? Uh, wouldn't it be uh, yes, wise, instead of uh, resecting 80, 90 no, percent it's, of... It's a good idea, but my question to you is how do you know what are the metastases resistant to chemo? And those who For are example, not resistant. For example, those who are uh, increasing in size or uh, active on PET, uh, on PET CT. Yes, but it is a, a very unusual situation. I, I fully agree with you. The, so, those patients existed with, uh, I would say, a, a dichotomy between some uh, tumor that uh, indeed uh, respond very well and one clone who, did, who resist to chemotherapy. Why not? It is also a possibility in a way to... Uh, to but we go a step further as compared to what I propose today. But why not? Why not? In the near future, why not? So, so René, just at, at the end, maybe I don't know a word of caution. You're probably right with the debulking. There's a lot of study which is a selection bias. I mean, that's the main issue. You're probably right. But I think we, we, just, we presented a case yesterday. I think it, it deserves, I think you should give a word of caution. This should be done only in the setting of protocols because the danger is that everybody starts to resect anything, right? Because René Adam has said that if we can, even if we don't take everything, it's good. And I think it's very important that it's not done, number one, by people who have no competence to do that, or even those who have, they do on protocol. What's your word of caution? Yes, that's why I have been very careful, first in the result, and second in the indication for such type of patient. The, the mortality should be very low, and. Clearly, I would not advocate to do a complex liver surgery with a high risk and so on in such type of patient. Surgery should be relatively simple with a sparing parenchyma hepatectomy uh, because we are in a context where this is not validated. So we should not increase the risk, not having the, the security to, be, to, 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 to open the way to a better survival to the patient. So this is a condition. The second condition is a very strong response to chemotherapy. Third condition, a tumor board, I would say, confirmation of this. The surgeon should not take the decision by himself, but should be also a decision by radiologist and the medical oncologist in charge of the patient. And I fully agree with you that in the first step, this should be possibly reserved to experienced centers, uh, I would say, in liver surgery. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much for... Can I have a question, please? It's a question. Can I have a question, please, for René? Yeah, uh, very very short. Yes, yeah, sorry. Very, very brief. Uh, uh, thank you, René. It's a um, brave and pioneering work. I'm really impressed with the number of years. One point I would like you, if you could shed the quality of life as well, because still many patients think if there is metastasis, that's the end of the story, and they have a miserable life, whether they have a chemotherapy or surgery. So if you shed the life on the... Uh, shed a, an explanation on the quality of life uh, that would be helpful for people to be more encouraged to have treatment as well. Thank you. Thank you, Rashad. Uh, I would say that, uh, of course, to, for having quality of life, we should have life. And uh, as you know, the, our experience with patients, it's probably shared by all the surgeons in the, in, in the room, is that all the patients do the maximum effort to be alive. And so this is the first objective. And now surgery is doing better, I would say, in terms of quality of life than continuous chemotherapy. 
And this is also the feedback we receive from our patients. So if by doing surgery we avoid, I would say, period with uh, long-term chemotherapy, is also a way to provide, I would say, a, a quality of life benefit also for the patients. Do they can they go back to work and lead the near normal social life? For example, that's the question that we've Why not? always been asked. To. Why not? This is a, indeed should be included in the prospective study, an estimation of the quality of life. Thank you for your suggestion. Okay, thank you, Rene. Thank you. Thank you.